Okay, so let's get started. Uh, this month, we're going to be continuing our little series of trying networking libraries. This month, we're going to look at a... It's more than just networking. It's a, it's a application framework called POCO, uh, which I believe the original naming was uh, plain old components or something like that. But uh, from this diagram here, you can see that um, POCO gives you components for interacting with databases, uh, interacting with crypto, cryptography, so you encrypt and decrypt byte streams. They have a set of foundation facilities that sit on top of the C++ standard library. Uh, you've got XML uh, parsing and uh, generation, um, their little utility classes, the network classes, which we'll be looking at, um, and then there's uh, support for network communication over a secure socket layer and interacting with zip archives. So um, if we go over to the POCO website, so that's pocoproject.org, it is um, you know, not necessarily strictly networking, although networking is one of the uh, core aspects of POCO. Uh, so, okay, so POCO originally came from portable components, which is where the original name came from. But if we look at over here, they have a bunch of different slide decks uh, describing a bunch of different use cases introduction and overview which we'll take a look at in a second but they've got um, facilities for uh, manipulating uh, byte streams and facilities to help you with error handling debugging memory management strings text and formatting um, abstracting your platform so whether if, if you're programming in a Linux environment then you're targeting a POSIX platform and for, inst for instance, one operation that is platform specific that is not directly supported by the C++ standard library until the file system library was added. For instance, iterating over the contents of a directory. Usually you had to write your own code that did it one way under a Unix style POSIX operating system and you had to write a different flavor of that code under Windows um, so they have abstractions for the platform, um, random number generation, date and time handling, uh, working with the file system. Again, POCO has been around for a while, so it predates the file system library that was added to the C++ standard library. Uh, notifications and events. If you've ever worked with um, QT, then... Uh, slots and signals is kind of what this notification and events um, portion of POCO is about. Streams gives you a way to abstract things like talking over a socket or getting data out of a zip file, a zip archive as a coherent stream abstraction that is consistent with IO streams, streams, a logging facility, ways of dealing with shared libraries An another um, aspect that is difficult in a cross-platform environment is opening shared libraries dynamically and obtaining pointers to functions by their function name so they have an abstraction for that uh, multi-threading caching hashing processes and so on the other one we're going to look at is network programming. Uh, some comments in the chat about audio and video quality. Sorry, I don't have any control over that. It's the weakest link on the internet is the one that you're being subjected to. The weakest link between me and you. All I can do is you know, control. I, I have very little control from my end, but uh, the video will be in HD, will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, and that's being recorded locally, so it's always a high-quality recording. Um, 
you know, I'm stuck on Comcast. What can you say? It's not the greatest. At any rate, so uh, if we take a look over here at their uh, introduction to Poco slide set, um, I'm going to skip through some of this until we get down into, okay, here. So um, any and dynamic any, these are kind of like uh, stood variant. Again, the POCO facilities existed before these things were standardized. Um, they have a caching framework, cryptography, as I mentioned, date and time classes. Uh, the date and time classes are handy when it comes to network programming because you often uh, encounter things like dates that are specified by RFC 822 or some kind of other RFC that specifies a particular date format. Um, and again, those uh, classes existed before you had stood chrono for manipulating dates and times. Uh, you've got an FTP client for transferring files. That's something that's kind of nice because a lot of networking libraries only are supporting HTTP or raw sockets, so they don't have FTP support, and coding an FTP client is annoying. So if you need FTP support, uh, POCO is a good thing to look at. They have a, they also have a, a complete HTTP and HTML solution, so you can write a complete web server in POCO. You can write a web client in POCO, and that client can also handle web sockets, uh, which is also interesting. Um, so as I said, they got HTTP, uh, logging, uh, facilities for dealing with multi-threading and thread pools and so on. Uh, they got a POP3 client, uh, SMTP support, so you can talk to um, a mail server that is SMTP pro protocol, simple mail transfer protocol. That's for uh, originating email messages, sending email messages to somebody. POP3 is a an email protocol for uh, reading mail messages out of a mailbox, a remote mailbox. Um, this uh, reactor framework is is again uh, a uh, kind of a uh, how do I want to say this? It's kind of like a combination of uh, it, it's a way of doing uh, multi-processing, you know, with multiple threads and thread pools. Uh, the regular expression, again, we have support for that in the standard library now, but POCO has been around for a while, so th they had good regex support before it was widely available in standard library. As I said, SMTP client for sending email. You've got uh, database access uh, through SQL, um, secure socket layer support, shared library support, uh, smart pointers and memory management helpers. Uh, you can deal with uh, sockets either raw or um, as streams, uh, so either TCP or UDP sockets. Um, they also have all the necessary um, content encoding handlers. So if you're dealing with mail messages, for instance, the mail message may have an attachment. That means you have to be able to deal with the meme specification, M-I-M-E. And that means you have to be able to parse all the little headers that correspond to um, the annotations that say what is the content type of each of the parts in a multi-part message and how are the parts in a multi-part message related. You know, there may be a, a text version and an HTML version of the same content, though that's a multi-part alternative uh, between text uh, and HTML. There may be uh, binary attachments like images that are encoded by Base64, or there may be um, UTF-8 content that is encoded through a, an encoding called Quoted Printable. All these little details as you drill into handling just mail messages alone can be very complicated. So just being able to have support for talking over a socket is just the start of how you would send and receive rich format email messages. So they have all the ancillary classes that help with uh, email message parsing and generation. Um, they have a server framework. They have classes for handling URIs and UTF-8 and Unicode. Uh, UUIDs, which is universally unique identifiers. 
these are uh, I think it's 64-bit value it's kind of really common in the Windows world if you do any COM programming but they're handy for generating unique identifiers for things like every if you're doing a multi-part mail message then every part has to have an identifier so these UUIDs come in handy there XML parsing and generation um, via the two common interface um, techniques which is either the document object model that's the DOM model where the entire XML document is slurped in processed as a hierarchy of objects or the SACS2 model which is incremental and lets you kind of uh, invoke handlers as the pieces of XML are encountered and the DOM model works fine for small XML documents but once the documents get to be really large then that consumes a lot of memory and processing time to build this giant structure in memory so the SACS model where you're getting callbacks invoked as the elements are encountered and parsed uh, is, is a preferable alternative so for these two different scenarios uh, zip files um, and the let's keep going through here browsing through their implementation I can see that their first um, release was in 2005 so this library is 17 years old which is why a lot of the lower level features are also echoed in the standard library uh, they are now but they weren't then right in 2005 we didn't even have C++ 11 yet so um, it's been around for a while it's cross-platform Windows Linux Mac um, various flavors of Unix um, embedded platforms as well iOS Windows CE uh, QNX is a real-time uh, operating system so it's got a pretty wide range of features let's take a look at their slide deck for networking which is what we're going to talk about today and um, so they've got basics uh, sockets TCP server framework uh, the reactor framework as I said is a a way of um, it's a paradigm for network processing uh, they've got high-level protocol implementation for SMTP that's email FTP and HTTP now the what we're going to look at today is an implementation of the NNTP protocol that's network news transport protocol for accessing messages off of a Usenet network and that is one that they don't provide but when we look at our little implementation that we've put together it is strongly based off of some of the um, code that they have for email processing because really news messages are very similar to mail messages so we're gonna be able to leverage that they've got um, facilities for looking up IP addresses so the domain name system is how you translate from a host name like google.com to look up the IP address and the IP address is what you really use to talk to a machine but since IP addresses are not user-friendly the domain naming system it gives you a way of mapping names to IP addresses so they have facilities for doing that name lookup um, they've also got low-level um, internet protocol address support for you know multicast um, or broadcast uh, a loopback a loopback connection is just talking to your own machine multicast is a way of sending out a single packet and having it be received by multiple receivers without having to transmit the packet um, uh, transmit a copy of the packet to each receiver so it's a broadcast style uh, protocol so they've got support for that um, a socket address is typically not just an, an IP address alone is not enough to identify an application somewhere out on a machine on the internet you have to have the IP address which is the machine identifies the machine and then the port identifies um, the application so an IP address or a, a socket address rather is a combination of an IP address and a port so that identifies a unique service somewhere out there on the network uh, as I mentioned name resolution and here's an example of kind of you know what this looks like it kind of it fits all on one 
slide. They've got namespaces for their different major components. And then, um, so like the net, all the networking stuff is in POCO net namespace. And then within the net namespace, there's nested namespaces for, um, no, sorry, this is uh, using a particular class so it's bringing in a particular identifier from within the poco net namespace so uh, the host entry class is made available and the IP address class is made available which they are using looks like down here uh, and similarly DNS so um, not going to go through every little detail here because we're not going to be needing to program at the lowest level of network programming for what we're going to try to do but if we need to we can access raw sockets we can access uh, a stream socket which treats a socket as an IO stream um, you can have a datagram socket so a datagram socket does not In cat, it, it, that's a UDP socket. So the UDP protocol, which is I forget what the U stands for, but the DP is the datagram protocol. Um, and these are uh, the lightest overhead style packets you can have on the internet, and they don't ensure that the messages are delivered in order or that they're even delivered at all. That's up to the application. A a stream socket makes those guarantees that's TCP IP transmission control protocol layered on top of IP internet protocol and so a TCP IP socket is a socket that makes sure that all the messages arrive in the correct order you know the order that you send them is the order in which they are received and that all the messages that are transmitted are acknowledged so you know that they were successfully received so that no um, messages were dropped. Um, we don't need to look into these low-level socket classes. You can review this yourself if you want, but um, they have a pretty good abstraction here. So at whatever level of network programming, whether it's low or high level that you want to operate at, uh, their classes take care of the details and you just can get on with what it is you're trying to do in your application. Um, they have a server framework so in a server application you're going to be listening for connections and then when a connection is accepted then you're going to be receiving requests over that connection and then sending responses. So they have a um, server framework for um, generic TCP network applications so this does not require that you use an existing protocol like HTTP or SMTP or what have you you can have your own private messaging over a socket connection and the server framework that they have will use a thread pool to allocate threads to incoming connections so that uh, just if you get a one busy client it's not uh, choking the server and preventing other people from talking to your network uh, service so that's kind of nice um, it's nice to have that um, the um, this idea of a reactor is the idea of uh, combining um, sockets with uh, so-called non-blocking I.O. So in Berkeley sockets uh, or WinSock, you call a function called select and you give it uh, an array of file descriptors that represent open sockets and the select call returns immediately or you can supply select with a timeout and it'll return either when data is available or when the timeout is expired but usually you use select to basically ask the networking system are any of these sockets do they have uh, data ready to be received or data ready to be written 
Uh, so the reactor framework is a way for you to get that kind of non-blocking I.O. Um, and again, we're not going to be going into the details of the reactor framework, but it's just important to know that it's there. They, on top of their TCP server, they already have an, an HTTP server framework. So if what you really need to do is make a little web server that's going to receive HTTP requests and needs to respond to those, you can do it with their built-in HTTP server framework. You don't have to implement HTTP yourself. And um, here's some examples of HTTP server. They have a request response a set of classes. This is pretty typical for most HTTP um, implementations. They have support for cookies and credentials. So uh, if you need to secure your HTTP server and have uh, some kind of authentication, there's an authentication mechanism in, H in HTTP and it supports that. Um, if you're submitting complex data to the server, you can support HTML forms. Uh, you can also write an HTTP client, so you're, this is where you're acting like a web browser instead of acting like a web server. Um, so, in addition to those little slide decks that are covering the various aspects of POCO, they also have generated Doxygen style documentation for everything in the library. So inside here if we look at you know the POCO namespace here's you know all the classes that are available in that namespace and the sub namespaces so there's quite a bit of stuff in here as you can see now let's go over and take a look at some code so what I did let's take a look at this mail sample. What I did was uh, I took some of their samples from their library and just copied them over here and made little um, CMake lists to be able to take those examples and build them. So if we take a look at over here where I've got uh, the samples copied. Now I've uh, been using VC package for most of these libraries that we've been talking about for some time now and it works really well um, sometimes though if we say VC package search POCO sometimes you'll see that VC package says oh I've got this optional feature for POCO called net SSL and that's net SSL support for POCO and we haven't covered what that looks like in the manifest when we've been looking at these various libraries because we haven't been pulling in any optional features but just to go over that briefly normally in your dependencies it's just a list of names uh, so if I say VC package search open SSL uh, we see that there's here open SSL at version 1.1.1n which is pretty recent so if I'm going to use the optional feature from POCO called net SSL, I also need the open SSL dependency. And normally when we would be listing in our VC package manifest JSON file, the things that we depend on, we normally just list the name. But if you need optional features from some dependency, then you break it out as a little object array and you give the value of your dependency for the name key and then the features key is an array of strings listing the optional features from this dependency that we also want to bring in so that was the first time that I'd had to do anything like that with VC package but it's pretty straightforward you do the normal um, building with CMake where you instruct CMake to use VC package as your toolchain file and it pulls down all the source and it builds everything I've already done that so we don't have to wait for it to pull down the source and build it because it takes quite a while to build OpenSSL uh, itself and then there, uh, POCO is also not a small uh, surface area as we saw so it builds a lot of stuff for POCO
Now, um, I mentioned that a mail or a news message from NNTP looks very much like a mail message, and 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 for all intents and purposes, it is a mail message. So looking at how POCO handles uh, sending an email will be instructive for what we want to do in writing an NNTP client. And just for reference, if you go over here to Wikipedia, NNTP is specified by RFC 3977. And if we go there, we see you can read all the details, but basically everything in NNTP looks like a command. It's a text-based protocol, so we send commands as a text string and optional arguments after the command. Sometimes the arguments are required. The, the protocol specification tells us what we need to do. And this is very similar to the mail protocol. So if we look at, if we go back over here, so here's a simple client example that sends an email. So you supply it with the mail host, that is the, ho the host name of the machine that is running the SMTP server. We don't need to supply the port number because there's a standard port number for SMTP and it will use that by default. If you have a mail server on a non-conventional port, you can also do supply the port number explicitly, but in this example, they don't need to do that. You supply the sender, which is the email address of the person sending them email, and the recipient, which is the email address of the person that is going to receive the email. And it builds the little email message in code here it has a a mail message an instance of the mail message class that it has instantiated it set the sender on the email it set the recipient on the email it set the subject of the email and then the body of the email is referred to as the content which it attaches uh, using this string part source I uh, remember I mentioned that in email there's this concept of there might be multi-part messages, so this is basically saying we're just going to stick a plain string on there, and then it's going to add an attachment um, as this POCO logo. It's going to establish, so this is just the mail message. This is just a client-side data structure that represents the mail message that we're trying to send. Then they establish a session with the SMTP server by uh, giving the name of the host. They log in to the mail server. If you have a wide open mail server, that's obviously a vector for spam, so nobody runs wide open mail servers anymore. So for a mail server to accept your message and deliver it, you have to authenticate yourself to it. So it uses the login method to do that. It then sends the message and then closes the session. So this is really similar to what we want to do with an NNTP client that we want to write. And if we look over here, we can see what I lifted out of POCO. If we look at POCO in their distribution inside net source, and we look at the SMTP stuff, there's here's the implementation of this SMTP client session and uh, you can see that if we also look at the let's look at the header so include POCO net SMTP client session so here you can see they've got the Doxygen comments on all their classes. This is how they're generating all that documentation up to date from their source code. And the part that we're going to want to look at is down here. So uh, a session to an SMTP server is represented with a dialog socket. So this is a 
socket that represents two-way communication so it's a dialogue back and forth between the client and the server um, they just have a string that's storing the host that we're connected to and a boolean that specifies whether or not the connection is open and then inside here they've got methods to do logging in to open the connection to close the connection to send a mail message uh, we can also send individual commands uh, looks these methods are all public um, there's various authentication methods that we can use to authenticate ourselves to the SMTP server and so on. So this is very, very similar to what we want to do when writing an NNTP client session object. So what I did was just start with this SMTP client session and started modifying it. And I've got my little implementation right here. Uh, we can look at the header. Let's look at the header first. Okay, so I didn't go through the trouble of writing Doxygen for everything that um, I implemented because, you know, this is just for the purposes of discussion. I'm not going to publish this uh, as an actual implementation. You know, maybe someday I flesh it out and document it and contribute it to, to POCO, but really NNTP is considered kind of a legacy. Um, communication protocol at this point which is really kind of too bad because um, when everything has got switched over to web based forums everything was balkanized and you know if you go to a forum about a topic on one website they don't share messages with um, web forums on other websites about other topics so you can't have a single place that you go and read everything that you're interested in you have to go all the different websites and they have different user interfaces and they have different forums on different topics and different structures for messages um, and if they let you do little markup for embedded images and whatnot each one is little is different from the other so it's not uniform it's been balkanized now which is kind of unfortunate and it also means that the control is centralized meaning um, if that site ever goes down or they just take it off the internet because they don't want to run it anymore then the whole archive of all those messages disappear and so on usenet and NTP is a distributed discussion mechanism so if somebody leaves the network it doesn't delete all the messages on that topic and people can continue discussing that topic and continue to have the discussion even though a, one server disappears. Uh, so it's um, a distributed and replicated network for discussion which makes it more robust. At any rate, uh, it's still at this point it's basically a legacy protocol so people aren't really that interested in NNTP much anymore but it does have that um, advantage of being distributed and replicated so there's no central authority that can impose a, a single viewpoint over things which is a nice thing to have at any rate um, if we go back and look at the specification for NNTP one of the uh, commands that is described early we're still in the examples. Okay, the capabilities command. And this is a command that you can issue to a server, and the server will tell you basically what features that it supports. There are optional features in the protocol, and um, there are certain things that are mandated by the specification and certain things that are optional in the NNTP specification. So here's an example you send the capabilities command it gives you back a list and then here's the various capabilities and the responses from NNTP always when it's a multi-line response the multi-line response is always ended by a single line that contains only a dot and there's various other little details like the protocol always specifies that each of these lines in a multi-line response are always terminated by a carriage return line feed sequence uh, 
So it's it's always carriage return line feed. It's never just line feed alone or just carriage return alone. So little things like that have to be handled in our client sessions so that um, somebody using an NNTP client session from POCO, they don't have to worry about those little details. So um, if we go back and look at our code, I implemented a little method that um, we'll give you back as a vector of string whatever the capabilities of the remote server are um, the there's a way that you can it's probably best if I go back up here to table of contents and we drill down into the individual commands but there is the I think it's list group uh, no wait sorry Let's go back up here. It is the list command list news groups so in NNTP all the discussions are organized by topic each topic area is called a news group within each news group there is a zero or more messages each message is can be identified by either a number or an ID string and an ID string is basically the same as an SMTP message ID and uh, after you've identified an article you can fetch the header of the article which is a bunch of name value pairs that appear at the the, the start of the article this is things like the from field that says who posted the article the subject of the article um, the news groups that the article was posted to and so on um, if, if you were uh, posting non-text content like images then the there might be um, meme related fields in the header like the content type and uh, things like that um, again all very similar to uh, the structure of a mail email message um, but one of the things that you want to do is you want to list what news groups are available on the server so you can present that to the user and they can select which news groups they want to read and that is what this list news groups um, method does you use a a wildcard pattern so news group names are um, identifiers separated by dots and arranged into a hierarchy we'll see an example of that in a second so this wildcard uh, matching pattern can be used to specify just list the news groups that match this pattern uh, once we've identified which group we want to read we can select it by passing in that news group name and um, when we when we list news groups we get back two strings one is the news group name and the other is a string that may be non-empty that is a uh, descriptive text explaining you know what this topic is about uh, when we select a news group we get back um, the name of the news group that was selected the number of articles that are available the low article number and the high article number if we have um, select once we've selected a news group then that news group is becomes what's called the the current news group in the NNTP protocol so NNTP unlike HTTP NNTP is a stateful protocol so every client that is connected to a an NNTP server has some current state associated with it and that current state represents the currently selected news group and possibly the currently selected article or what well, sorry the current news group and the current currently selected article when you select a news group the first article within that news group is always the one that is selected by default until you select a different article the um, this article header will give you back a vector of strings representing the name value pairs that are in um, that's the header for the currently selected article um, and this article raw will give you back the entire article so the header and the body and they'll be separated by a blank line so somewhere in that vector of strings there will be 
it'll start with a bunch of strings that are name value pairs of the header then there will be an empty string that represents the separation between the header and the body and then there will be strings that represent the content of the body of the article um, I've also had this method that lets you um, instead of getting back the article as just raw strings I can get the current article by um, as a it's basically an SMTP mail message since they're they're basically identical I just prov that provide um, a type def equivalent type alias for mail message that's called news article just so the API reads a little cleaner but they're they're essentially well they are identically the same they're treated identically the same in the code um, this uh, stat method implements the stat command which lets you uh, supply an article number and then the response tells you whether or not that is a valid article number for the currently selected group and this uh, variation of the article method lets you get the news article corresponding to a specific article number so um, before we drill a little bit more into the details here to see what that looks like let's see what it looks like to run this little news reader that I wrote just so you can get a feel for uh, what this looks like so there's a news server called news.gmain.io and that basically is a news server that mirrors various mailing lists as news groups so instead of receiving these high volume discussions as all these mail messages showing up in your mailbox you can read them as news groups and they happen to host a news group reflector for all the boost mailing lists and what's interesting here is um, because these news group reflectors have been up for a long time many years they have um, you know the archive they, they don't delete anything because these news messages don't take up much space so they haven't deleted any of the messages so we can go back and look at the old messages from say you know boost.announce so my little UI here is just I'm um, reading lines of text off of standard in and presenting a little menu by uh, printing out a bunch of numbered choices or a queue for quit so if we select one for the announcement news group it's now going out and statting the article numbers in that news group to get the first uh, you know 10 or so articles it's, it's the first 10 it's statting the article numbers to find out which articles exist until it gets up to 10 and then it obtained the subject of those article numbers so you'll notice article 10 article number 10 is missing so it pulled 10 articles but they're numbered 1 through 9 and 11 and then if I select one of these um, articles by article number it went and fetched the content of that article as a news article instead of just as raw strings and then so it printed out a few fields out of the header so here's the from here's the subject the date this, this is from 2002 so this is a 20 year old message announcing uh, that boost 1.28.0 has been released by Beeman Dawes who's one of the founders of boost um, unfortunately Beeman Dawes has passed away so I'm not worried about anybody seeing his email address on this video because he's not going to be there on the other end of that mailbox uh, I'm printing out the body of the message and then once I've got either to the end of the message or uh, 24 lines or so I'm um, I'm uh, going back to my article selection menu so this is a very very simple newsreader I can quit reading articles and go back to select a different news group uh, I can select um, say like uh, the news group for CVS commit messages it's going out and fetching the first 10 articles that it can find in this case they happen to be all numbered 1 through 10 
and these you know these, these are the commit messages generated by the CVS the concurrent version system that's the version control system they used to use before they switched to subversion and before they switched again to git everything with boost is on git on github now but we can select this message and you see here is um, the commit message and the subject and then the body of the message and this one happens to be a little, be a little bit longer so it printed out about 24 lines of the message body and then it's prompting me to I can either quit to go back to selecting articles or I can just press return to see the remainder the, or, the, or the next 24 lines and so it printed out 24 more lines or less of the article body and then put me back to my little article selector so I can quit selecting articles I can quit selecting news groups and then the program exits so that's pretty uh, straightforward simplistic you know console oriented news reader and I have another little uh, program that I wrote here called NNTP dump and if we run that let's step through that in the debugger here go ahead and build it and apparently I've changed something what did I change ah okay let's just comment this out I didn't or well let's just implement it okay so I this thing used to return a vector of just plain strings now it returns a vector of pairs of strings so let's just go fix that I need a little overload here for print print const uh, group desk desk.first with a space and desk.second is just a pair of strings and oh I need it. it's a vector of group desks so print group desk okay let's try it again it didn't take long okay so this little dumper it establishes a session to the news server prints out the capabilities prints out the news groups that match this wildcard matching specification selects this news group prints out the header of the first article available that's the current article when we select a news group prints out the whole news article and then um, exercises that same option again but this time getting it as a parsed uh, structure that is basically remember this thing is just a, a type alias for a mail message if we look at the output that we got we can see if we go back up here to the top so here were the capabilities that were reported by the server here's all the news groups that matched our wildcard matching pattern and here is the header when we when we did select a news group that didn't generate any output but we did have another little separator here so we could see that that's what happened and then the current article that was selected which is the first article in the news group here's the header for that article you can see there's a bunch of you know 
internal little fields telling us about you know how many different news servers or mail servers did this message go through before it ended up here and here's a little cross-reference line that tells us that this article is it's article one inside uh, sorry inside this news group if it were posted to multiple news groups the cross-reference line would tell us the article numbers for the other news groups that it was posted to and then here's the uh, entire contents of the article that we got from this uh, news article when we told it to, to print the whole thing it's printing the entire uh, message and uh, oh sorry um, the article raw was this was this version so that's the entire header followed by a blank line followed by the entire body that was the raw article contents and then this version with a much more slimmed down header is the version that we printed from the formatted uh, or the parsed uh, news article uh, structure that we read back out. Okay, so let's take a look at, let me get rid of that. Let's take a look at our client session implementation. So it's, it was really, really easy to write this. Now, um, this is in contrast to what we tried with Facebook's Wangle, where we didn't get very far. But with Poco, we were able to get far enough down in implementing the protocol that we were able to write a simple news reader. Now, um, admittedly, I did copy and paste uh, some stuff from the SMTP client session that they had. Um, but I've I've deleted everything out of this file that has to do only with SMTP and I've I've just trimmed it down to the stuff that we need for NNTP. Um, these this dialogue input stream, uh, dialogue IO stream, and dialogue stream buff, those are three classes that collaborate together to give us this um, uh, dialogue input stream that we end up using when we read the responses back from the NNTP server. Now those were um, private to the implementation of the SMTP client session class in POCO. Uh, I kind of feel like they're useful enough that it might be worthwhile to ask the POCO people to surface those, but they're pretty, you know, as you can see, this is the entire implementation. So they're really small inline classes. I don't feel too bad about having those duplicated in here. Our client session initializes a socket from uh, the caller and we can create a client session from an existing socket or we can create a client session from a host and a port and um, when you're given a host and a port combination we just use a socket address to bind those two together it'll do a name lookup on the host um, if we go back over here to the header, you see that I'm providing a default value for the port, which is 119, which is the standard value for NNTP servers, the default reserved port number for NNTP services. So most of the time you just need to supply a host name. We'll make a socket that's bound to the address specified by that host and the NNTP port. Again, that defaults to 119. Uh, initially, the socket is not open. This just uh, establishes what the socket will connect to once we call open. Uh, when we're shutting down the session, we're going to close the socket. And because uh, destructors are not supposed to throw exceptions, we're going to wrap that all in a try catch and catch any exception that came out of the close. Um, and in TP servers can implement a timeout if you don't make a request within a certain amount of time once you connect to it then it'll disconnect you the server will disconnect you that's something to think about if you're in a debugger because if you're uh, halted in the debugger after you've opened the connection but before you've sent your first command if you, if you don't resume quickly and issue a command soon enough the the new server will just disconnect you so that's something to think about 
so to open the connection um, we just send a uh, we receive the, the, the status message off the socket it's going to take that status message and put it in a string and we're going to check for uh, positive completion on that status now as I mentioned SMTP and NNTP are all very or are, are, are both of them are very similar and and HTTP is also very similar and the thing to understand about all these protocols let me scroll down here so we can find the response codes so you send a command to the server and it responds with uh, a line of text and the first three characters of that line of text are what's called the response code and they're broken down into classes where they tell you you know this is just a message that's for it's informational it's not telling you success or failure or it's telling you that if it's a, a so-called 2xx response then it's a success um, if you have commands that require multiple lines to be sent then the first response uh, or a partial okay could be a 300 or a 3xx response code um, 4xx means you had some kind of syntax error in the command 5xx is you know some kind of unknown error um, and then the subsequent digit in the status can tell you you know more detail about the operation as it was as it was performed so every time we send a command the first thing we need to do is read back the response from the socket and when we first connect to the server the very first thing an NNTP server does is send you a one line status message that tells you whether or not you know you can connect to the server whether that connection was respond uh, successful or not so we're going to read that when we when we open the socket the first thing we do is receive that status message and uh, check its um, to see if it's succeeded or not um, if we get an error we're going to throw this NNTP exception POCO has an exception framework uh, they uh, have macros for declaring an exception class and macros for implementing the exception class if we drill into the declaration a little bit it kind of boils down into that when you declare an exception it emits a declaration for a class that provides a bunch of the boilerplate for their exception infrastructure um, and and our NNTP exception derives from the net exception that is the base class for all POCO network exceptions. I didn't decide to create my own network hierarchy. I created this NNTP client session in line with the other POCO networking classes. So their net exception extends POCO IO exception and POCO IO exception extends POCO runtime exception, POCO runtime exception extends POCO exception, which extends STUD exception from the standard library. So they have their own hierarchy of exceptions, and I just followed that uh, when I was declaring my NNTP exception, which I use in my implementation any place that you know the status comes back in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, when we are close closing the connection uh, the clean way to I mean you can just close the socket right the, the servers not gonna hopefully <laughs> the server is not gonna crash just because you close the socket on it on it unexpectedly but the friendly way to do that is to send a quit command um, so um, to close the, the connection send a quit close the socket now I mentioned that we need to read these multi-line responses back until the received line of text is just a dot so this multi-line response is doing that uh, we're gonna receive a message off the socket and as long as that message is not dot then we're gonna uh, 
just push that back onto a vector of strings and you know, receive the next uh, line of response back from the server and then return the whole thing. So to implement the capabilities command, we just send the command capabilities. We get the status response back. We check that. Looks like I've got a, yeah, I've got a mixture of uh, tabs and spaces here. That's my bad. Um, we got a mixture, uh, sorry, we've got a status that comes back, and if that was an error, then we, you know, are just going to throw an exception. Otherwise, we're going to return that vector of strings that represents the capabilities that came back in the multi-line response. Similarly, when we're listing news groups, we're going to uh, send the list command with the sub action news groups. You, there's multiple things you can list according to the specification. This wildcard matching pattern is the argument to the command. And if we drill into this uh, send command guy, all he's doing is calling send message on the socket and then calling receive status message on the socket. So really the socket's doing the underlying uh, socket class, this dialog socket that we've gotten from Poco. If we drill into that, this is uh, dialog socket dot h. This is a Poco header, so I, dialog socket is not something that I wrote. That comes with Poco. It's really doing the heavy lifting for us. We just need to provide these commands that we need to send, uh, do a little bit of error checking, get back the multi-line response and then this is just some code to parse it out into a more meaningful data structure when we return it so that we return a vector of these string pairs that represent newsgroup names and newsgroup descriptions. So we'll just uh, do that with a call to uh, transform algorithm to transform this vector of plain strings and uh, we're going to insert these pairs back into this uh, response vector that we're going to, or this uh, return vector that we're going to return, and take each line of text, split on the first space or tab, um, handle the case where there was no space or tab, which means the description was empty. Otherwise, return um, a pair of strings that uh, represents the two portions of the line of text that was returned. Similarly, for select news group, we've got uh, the group command that we're going to send. And the argument is the group that we're selecting. Little uh, error checking to make sure that that command was successful. The form of the response that comes back looks like this. And um, here we're using uh, this parse unsigned static method on the number parser class from Poco to parse out an unsigned value from a string and you might notice here that the, you know it can it can even handle the situation where the string has uh, you know, separators for the thousands a comma or if you're in a European locale the separator is a dot and they use a comma for ins for the decimal instead of a dot. In the United States, it's flipped. We use a dot for the decimal and a comma for the separator. They use a comma for the decimal and a dot for the separator. So if you want to be handling multiple locales, you need to be able to say what that separator is. Uh, in, in this case, what comes back from the server never has any kind of separator, so we don't need to worry about that. But it's handy to have these um, parse unsigned and other parse methods on the number parser class from Poco so we didn't have to write that by using you know a string stream take the string put it into the string stream and then extract out the value and then do error checking and stuff like that Poco will do that for us so that's handy um, and then just we've got this little struct that represents the broken out pieces of that response we can just return that constructing it with uh, initializer syntax as the return value. Uh, same for article header. We're going to send a head command and then just read back the multi-line response and send that back to the caller. For the article raw command we're going to send 
or for the article raw method, we're going to send an article command and then return back the multi-line response. This one, uh, so we've got tabs here again. Let's just kind of format this. Get a more standard. There we go. Okay. Um, so this is where I'm using that little dialog input stream that I copied from the SMTP client session. In this case, we're requesting the current article, but we want it back as a parsed mail message, essentially. The news article is just, a, as I mentioned, it's just a type alias for mail message. So this is exactly what they were doing in the SMTP client. So they have a dialog input stream that's attached to the socket. They have a mail input stream that's attached to the dialog input stream. So this dialog input stream is just talking strings. This mail input stream knows how to take strings and turn them into mail messages. So it's essentially a mail message. Uh, it's not a coder decoder, so it's not a codec. It's just a decoder. It's a mail message decoder. And we tell it into this article, read a mail message from this mail input stream. And according to the protocol, there may be extra junk at the end. And we don't want that laying around because it's going to confuse any commands that we might send next. So they just gobble up whatever's remaining on the input stream to make sure that it's completely consumed. And in our case, what that's going to mean is this will gobble up uh, the remaining um, dot at the end. Remember, every multi-line response coming back from the server is going to end with a single line that's just consisting of a dot. Uh, similarly, stat, stat command. Um, now, these send command overloads, they only take string arguments. So we're going to use std to string to convert that article number into a string as the argument for the stat command. And the stat command doesn't return any data. It just returns a, um, a status. So all we do is just check that that status succeeded successfully. So stat returns a bool that just tells you whether or not that article number exists or not. If we want to extract a specific article by number into one of these news article classes, we can do that with the article command, supply the number as an argument, do that same business of reading the article from the response, and then down here is a, these little send command overloads. So that's the entire class. Here's a, invoking their little macro to implement an exception according to their little exception framework. So that's the entire implementation of this NNTP client session. Now, it's synchronous. So that's a little bit of a bummer. But it was very easy to put this together using POCO. I got to leverage their um, their command infrastructure for talking these text-based protocols, which are common between, if you look at the original um, protocol specifications for FTP, SMTP, which is email, HTTP, which is web requests, NNTP, which is news articles. You look at the protocol specifications for all of those, they all operate similarly. So we're able to leverage a lot of the existing code from POCO to get the low level details handled. And when we were able to leverage the mail message class, we got for free all of the multi-part handling, the ability to handle attachments, the ability to handle UTF-8 encoded strings that are embedded inside the news article. We got the ability to handle base64 encoded text that was in the body of the news article. We got the ability to handle quoted printable encoded text that was in the body. We didn't have to write any of that stuff. It's all shared in common with email so we can just leverage the existing email support. And you notice that we, even though their classes implement SMTP, 
we were able to leverage the classes for handling mail messages independent of the network protocol so we got to share all that um, for free and that saved us a lot of heavy lifting and got us to a, you know a minimal and not fancy newsreader but it's a newsreader that works and that is what you want from a networking library right you want uh, as they used to say in the X window system you, you want tools not rules you want composable objects that let you take orthogonal responsibilities and compose them in the way that you need in order to create the kind of application you need to write so the encoding of mail messages is defined orthogonal to the protocol you use to talk to a mail server so we can leverage their classes that they wrote for parsing encoded mail messages from a stream of bytes which is the response back from a mail server but once mail messages are stored locally in a file it's typically also just that same stream of bytes so if I were you know using a uh, mail client and we were saving copies of mail messages locally we would save the nor the natural thing to do is to save them in the same streamed byte format that we received them so parsing those mail streams the stream of bytes representing a mail message is identical to the same stream of bytes we need to parse to represent a news article so we can leverage all of that we didn't have to write all of that we got uh, quite a bit of functionality even though our little sample news reader here is just doing console IO it is not going to get confused by a news message that contains a binary attachment or a news message that contains UTF-8 or a news message that contains quoted printable or a news message that contains base64 encoded uh, bodies uh, quoted printable is also kind of weird it's used to encode non ASCII characters in the header as well as the body um, so if you're in Europe or somewhere outside the US and you've got you know uh, accented characters in your email address because that's the, the plain text part that has your name in it might have accented characters and so on those are all encoded by this quoted printable encoding uh, mechanism uh, and these days it's more likely that it might be UTF-8 instead of quoted printable um, but still quoted printable might enter into the equation because UTF-8 can still have character codes that are outside 7-bit ASCII so the UTF-8 8-bit encoded characters might still have a quoted printable encoding in order to appear as plain 7-bit ASCII characters in the header. It's one of those things that until you look at the raw byte streams you might never know this was taking place because typically everybody's using a modern day GUI client that is encoding and decoding all this stuff behind the covers for you. So to you, you look at your email and it always has the accented characters on display but if you ever look at the raw byte stream, you might notice that there that there's some funky encoding going on there. So Poco handling all that stuff for us is very, very useful. There's also the fact that Poco had that number parser that we were using. That was handy. And we didn't look at the source code for my newsreader. But if we take a look at that, I'm using that uh, parse unsigned from there. Um, they also have a, I don't know if I ended up using it or not. They have some other string utilities. They have a tokenizer that can be useful for parsing strings um, where you instantiate their string tokenizer class with the string to be tokenized and a string containing uh, characters that represent separators between tokens and then the string tokenizer then just acts as a collection and you can iterate over it with a range for loop or any kind of standard library algorithm to get the tokens out of the tokenizer one by one.
So they have a bunch of handy utilities like that. And we didn't even, you know, scratch the surface on things like database access or encryption or XML. There's a lot more to POCO than just networking. But in the end, we were able to write a primitive, fully functional newsreader in not very many lines of code. I mean, let's go to the bottom of the file. No, in less than 200 lines of code. So that's... And, and and that's because I got fancy in the way that I was formatting the output. I was doing things like uh, looping over the article numbers to find out which one was the longest so that when I printed out the article numbers, I could set the width of the field to be the longest so that things would always line up nice in columns. I mean, I, I was for console I.O., I was being extremely fancy, but... Um, still even with all that fanciness it was only 200 lines of code to get a little console program that would connect to a news server list out a bunch of news groups let me pick one of those news groups list the first 10 articles within that news group and then select one of those articles list it out and then quit the article selection level go back to a news group selection level select a different news group and then select different articles from that other news group and so on so in 200 lines of code I'd call that a win for Poco. It was it was very nice. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. If there's any questions, we can take that. It's the simplest way to show that it actually works. You know, it's a lot simpler to show it than, I mean, if I were going to write a real newsreader, I'd put a GUI around it. Um, I, I, if I was going to write a real newsreader, what I would do is have this NNTP client session as a piece of infrastructure, and then I would have something adapting that to represent the state of a newsreader. That's actually what I did in this little console uh, code is I wrote a little newsreader class and really everything is embedded in the newsreader and all that's really happening in this console application is it's selecting a you know it's connecting to a server selecting a group interactively and then once you've selected a group it's selecting an article interactively and then it's displaying that article and it's gonna you know keep displaying articles as long as you've selected one if you stop selecting articles and quit back out to the news group level, then you're selecting news groups until you quit out of that. And that's really the essence of, you know, reading some kind of grouped discussion area, right? You're going to read messages within a discussion area until you switch discussion areas or quit out of the whole thing. So, um, if I were to try to make a real news group, you know, reader out of this whole thing, what I would do is I have this I have this NNTP client session that handles the network protocol level and gives its consumer news messages. And then I would have a layer around that that abstracted the um presentation of those messages and the presentation of the data so I'm separating the presentation from the transport the NNTP client session is the transport I'd have a presentation layer and out of a console presentation layer a GUI presentation layer maybe I would want to expose it as you know web pages in which case I'd have like a rest API or something on top of it as a different presentation layer this is what um, uh, if you go look it up on Wikipedia, it's an architectural style that Alistair Coburn wrote about called ports and adapters. It's sometimes also called hexagonal architecture. But the idea is it's like these rings of abstraction. The server NNTP stuff is in the center. The next layer out is presentation. Uh, in this case, we're not interacting with any databases, but uh, you would have like a presentation ring around the outside. So the you know, you have a console presentation that's adapting the network, uh, the, the news article layer 
and then you'd have like a GUI presentation layer that's that's dealing with the news articles and maybe a REST API and so on. It's just a way of layering and factoring architecture. Okay, well that's going to wrap it up for this month.